The following is a Spirit Street production. You know, with spring football practice winding down, we're kind of making our rounds here, Big 12 Insiders, talking to a lot of the fan bases and finding out what's going on. Today, we've got Cincinnati checking in on year two of Scott Satterfield to find out where the program is, where it's going, what they expect. So we'll talk to Chad Brindle today, and we'll talk a little Cincinnati Bearcats. This is the Big 12 Insiders. Welcome to the Big 12 Insiders, your Big 12 sports show, presented by Synergy Financial Partners. Now let's go to booming North Texas, home of Studio 73. Here's your host, Brian Hanley. Hey, everybody, what's going on? This is Brian Hanley here with Big 12 Insiders. We got Chad Brindle, who covers UC Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati Bearcats for 24-7. Chad, how's it going today? It's good. It's been, uh, we had a transfer portal edition in basketball on Monday, right? Transfer portal edition in basketball on Tuesday, and then a top five women's commitment for the 2025 class on Wednesday. Okay. So, uh, it's, you know, the spring game was Saturday. That feels like three weeks ago right now. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, man. It's a busy time. I mean, we talked about this yesterday with, with the transfer portal for football just opening up. It's already been open for basketball. Spring practice is going on. For guys like yourself, first of all, you're super, super busy. And the coaches are extremely busy. It's just, it's one of those times, it's kind of like the middle of December. Uh, it's just one of those times where a lot of stuff is going on right now. Yeah, I mean, this used to be like almost decompressed time. Like, yeah. right? Like you hit the end of spring football. You got some AAU basketball in April that you got to get out and see. Uh, on the weekends, but it was kind of time to like, all right, we can take a breath. We just went August uh, to March, right? Football and basketball, like uh, now, no, <laughs> no. We go from we go from nine to eleven on the dial when we get to April. <laughs> Absolutely, it's just getting ratcheted up. But you know what? I'll be honest, it's busy, but I, I prefer well, it that way. I, I prefer it. it. Because, you know, that, that dead period that we always talk about, I'm like, eh, you know, that you're trying to fill stuff in there. I'd prefer to just be busy. We're working. We love it. So well, that that's the fun of this job, right? It's like yes. you get into this rhythm of, all right, we got stuff going on. And then, you know, when you do hit a slow period, your brain is like, I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm supposed to be doing right. something. But there's not really <laughs> a whole lot to do. I like it. I prefer just keep me busy. You know, that's, I explain to people, they're like, oh, well, like football to basketball. And then like, you get the summers off. Like, no, I'm not a teacher. Right. We, exactly. We don't get to take summers off. Either. No, no, I know. I totally get it. Totally get it. Well, going into year two, let's take a look at what Cincinnati is right now. Uh, year one, uh, making that leap. And I know we've talked a couple of times on some of the things uh, that Cincinnati, some of the challenges that they had going from the AAC into the Big 12. I don't think we necessarily need to talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, what is the overall, you know, the health of the program right now, Chad, going into year two? I get a much better vibe from the program right now than last year. And, and okay. let's face it, Brian, that when you make a change like they made, you're not replacing a coach that was failing in Luke. Correct. Figure. You're replacing a coach that had, Immeasurable success. He took he took Cincinnati to the college football playoff, <laughs> right? Like, so you're gonna have guys on that roster that are loyal to the old staff. You're sure. gonna have guys that are resistant to change, right? You're going to have push and pull that is very difficult in year one with a new staff. And I think they they trim some of that fat. They eliminated some guys that maybe weren't pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And then I think they did a really good job identifying guys in the portal that were going to fit into the culture. And you're not seeing nearly as much kind of internal push and pull. Um, you know, you would just hear like, well, they don't do it like Fix did, did it. They don't do it like this, sure. this coach did it or, you know, and, and that's not healthy. Let's no. Not at all. And, and, unless you just gut it to the studs, it's it's unavoidable because there right. are going to be guys that, you know, look back at, at what happened before and want it to be that way. And, and unfortunately, Luke Finkel took the Wisconsin job. Cincinnati didn't fire him. 
Cincinnati didn't run him out of town. They right. would have built him a damn statue if he stayed. Right. But he went somewhere else. And and you, you've got to clear that mindset. It, it, there is a point of reference here for Cincinnati for me. And that is the change from Brian Kelly to Butch Jones. Hmm. And if you go back and look in Butch Jones' first year, he still had a bunch of talent, but that team went four and eight. And it was because the leadership was fractured. Right. And if you talk about two different per- type of personalities, you <laughs> don't get on more opposite ends of the spectrum than Butch Jones and Brian Kelly. Right. And then what happened in that second year under Butch Jones? They tied for a Big East championship. And they bounced back. And, you know, the, the leadership kind of reconnected. Everybody got back to work. The thing that has impressed me more than anything about this offseason, generally when teams have a bad year, the offseason, they kind of ignore that it happened. Okay. Or they don't want to talk about it, right? Sure. They have, this has, like, and, and we're talking about content produced by UC football, where everybody is like, look, that wasn't good enough. Uh, whatever happened, whatever went wrong, right? Lead ownership of it, and what we did wasn't good enough. Uh, they had a video out last week. They do like these, you know, like twelve minute inside the program videos. And you had the strength and conditioning director, the you know the guy that's like number two in the program, saying in this video, "I didn't like this guy last year. He's going to be a starter." They brought him in as Jordan Young. They brought him in as a transfer from Florida. He started at boundary corner. He didn't have a great year. And then openly in this video, I didn't like you last year. Right. I didn't think you had it together. I didn't think you were about the right thing. I didn't think you pulled in the right direction. And now you are. Now you've got it together. Now you're on track. You're about the right things. And I've just seen an ownership that has honestly surprised me. Because a lot they don't they run from failure, right? We don't talk about it. It doesn't correct sports. And they've been like, no, we sucked. We didn't do good enough. We we weren't we weren't what we needed to be, and we have to be better. And I'm like, all right, yeah, congratulations for owning it. Yeah, well, you know, I think that's refreshing. Uh, number one for fans to hear if they don't already know that. I think that's refreshing. I think in just this attitude in society as a whole, <laughs> and I yeah. think that's kind of what you were getting at is that we as a society we run away from failures where hey, it just didn't happen. We're not even going to talk about it. Versus addressing what the problem is and saying, you know what, this is how we have to get better. This is what we were. It's not good enough. This is how you get better. I think that's an interesting approach. I also think it's a good approach for you to take as a football coach or as a football program to say, hey, we're better than this. And I think that's what it kind of comes down to, Chad, is that Cincinnati is better than what they put out there. And I think it's – I don't want to say they're embarrassed, but they're kind of embarrassed on – I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, I think we're we're better than this. You know, we got into this thing. Yeah, there's some things that we can do better, but we're embarrassed by what we put out there on the football field. We're going to go and show you, you know, that we're better than this. And that kind of leads me to my next thought and next question is, how are they rebuilding the roster or reshaping everything to be a better football team this year? It starts the quarterback, right? Sure. A thousand percent. If you're talking college football in 2024, if you're not right at quarterback, you're not yeah, right. You're not right. You're, you're not winning. Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, you are – the things you have to do to win with poor quarterback play, almost can't do it. doesn't – you can't do it. You just can't do it. And I have been really, really impressed with Indiana transfer Brendan Soresby. He's a redshirt sophomore. He's got the arm. Um, he, he's got the size, 6'3", about 230. Uh, and and more than anything, he has the pocket presence. He has kind of that awareness, situational awareness, when to slide, when to shift, when to run, um, as opposed to a lot of and, – and some of this was because the offensive line wasn't good and pass protection. But too often last year it was, okay, option A, hot route, get the hell out of the pocket. Right. And you just, that's not how successful offense runs in college. Never, never. So Soresby does a much better job feeling the pressure, feeling where things are around him. When he needs to get out on the run, guess what? Head is up, looking down the field. He'll run it, but he's looking to throw it first. And, And I think that was an issue that wasn't existent in their offense last year. 
the other thing is they they didn't throw and when you do when you're one option hot route run you're nothing's developing over the middle nothing's Correct. developing down the seams your offense becomes very one dimensional Sorsby looks like he is going to be able to solve that problem. A lot of work with the tight ends this year. Uh, Ohio State transfer Joe Royer uh, at tight end is, I think, a name that Big 12 fans are going to going to get used to this season. Um, so the offense has to be better. It was bad last right. year. And that's for a team that was top 10 in the nation in rushing. Yes. They rushed for over 200 yards a game, and the offense stunk. How does that work? I don't understand. <laughs> Well, that's the thing about a Sky Satterfield. Look, I'm familiar just because I'm they a run. diehard Louisville fan. They run the football. You know, yeah. they, they if, if you can say a lot of things about the offense, maybe it's too predictable. You know, maybe there's not a lot of sophistication on how they run the football. But the things that they do, they do extremely well. You know, yeah. and I think that's a, a, a testament of, of the coaching. It's just kind of what you said. Bad offense top 10 rushing offense that never goes together. I mean, it, no, it just doesn't, you know, but it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you mentioned the offensive line. Has they made any strides with the offensive line? Cause again, we're talking about a bad offense, but then we're again, talking about a rushing offense that's top 10 in the country. So I mean, the pass protection obviously has to get better. That's where, I mean, look, I was outside looking in and I watched several games. They struggled. They struggled with fire drill, you know, so, you know, has it got, I mean, it's obviously that it's gotten, had to have gotten better because I'll be honest. I don't think it could have gotten a lot worse. Well, they returned everybody. So, so they got the, better. Hopefully well, this is, this is the dangerous thing in sports, right? We, uh, we, we joke about this on the BCJ podcast all the time. My partner, Dave and I, just because you return every, if you return a bunch of bad dudes, yeah, it doesn't mean that you automatically get better. That's not no. <laughs> so. There is promise in the fact that they have shown to be a really good run blocking line. Where they need to get, where they need to see the most improvement, are at the tackle spots, protecting the edges. Right, because that last year was was where things really started to break down. Because as soon as the quarterback would hit his spot, as soon as Emory Jones would take the snap and and take a step or two. It was coming right at him, front side right. and back side. So there, they were better at that this spring than they were in the past. It was not, and last year we saw a lot of times in practice. It was what you saw, what you saw in games where it was high uh, sack, and Oof. and you can't win that way. You can't succeed that way. No. So we didn't see that nearly as much. Uh, you hope that is an effect of the offensive line getting better and not your defensive line underperforming with a bunch of new guys on the edge because they felt like they they really underachieved getting after the passer also next last year. Um, but, yeah, I, I think we did see some improvement from the offensive line. They were able to test out some depth. Luke Kandra, their All-American uh, guard, had like a, a hernia surgery. He missed most of the spring. So you were able to work some depth in there. And, and get some guys a little bit more reps in a spot where you know what your starter looks like. You know you're going to be good at, at right guard. Um, so that that kind of gives you a little bit even more hope that, okay, they're starting to build some depth on that offensive line. And if there is somebody that's struggling, they can, okay, we can move this guy here and, and move this around and, and try to get a little bit better configuration. But you, you have to hope, if you're Scott Satterfield, you are returning all five starters on your offensive line. I think, and I think you would agree with this from the Louisville perspective, Nick Cardwell is an outstanding offensive line coach. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Outstanding offensive line coach. You have to think he's going to get those guys better uh, in year two. Yeah, absolutely. Um uh couldn't have said it any better. I was actually going to come to that and say he's an outstanding offensive line coach. So if – if it's in them to be better, he's going to get them better. It's kind of what you mentioned. Yeah, yeah you bring them back. But I, I I really think there's some talent there. You know, I, I, I do. I think the guys are going to get better. Uh, I think they're we're going to see some stuff uh, out of them. Just also with a little bit more familiarity. You yeah. know, just being more familiar. The Think, things, things always come easier the more familiar we are with stuff. And just more from what they can expect from anything, Chad. Just from 
practice routines, game routines, anything, play calling. Sometimes, even as a player, you might think that the coach isn't being predictable, but they are being predictable, and you know what to expect. It's just I think a lot of a lot of newness has worn off, which is good. Yeah. That's a yeah. good thing that newness has worn off, so guys can be more familiar and be more comfortable. You, you know how sharp Cardwell is. Hmm? I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm, I guess one day at the, be, at the beginning of the season last year, I was sitting at practice in a chair uh, down on the field. And I guess I had my arms closed and it looked like my eyes were closed. Right. And he caught me sleeping. <laughs> so every practice, every practice since then, he's like, did you get your nap in? You good? Did you get your <laughs> nap in today? You, you ready to watch practice? I'm like, coach, I was not sleeping. He's like, yeah, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, we're going to take a quick break here on the other side of this. We'll be right back. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of maybe some spring battles uh, that happened during spring session. Also take a look at, at what the schedule holds and maybe not necessarily prediction, but just kind of what the, the overall program might look like based on what the schedule looks like. So we'll take one word from our sponsor here with Synergy Financial Partners. We'll be right back. At Synergy Financial Partners, the mission is to change the way Americans plan for their financial future. Synergy doesn't just offer you a financial plan. At Synergy, the goal is to help you find your best financial future. Learn more at SynergyFinancial.com. Welcome back to the show. Let's head back to the studio. All right, welcome back to Big 12 Insiders. Again, this is your man, Brian Hanley with Chad Brundle. So, Chad, um, any, I know spring practice just ended. Uh, yeah. Any spring battles uh, or that, that went on that maybe people need to know about, want to know about, or was this more of a, you know what, we've got guys in, let's work on a lot of fundamentals, and let's just try to get better as a team versus – having a ton of competition for actual jobs. So what they did on defense, I'm fascinated to hear your take on this. Mm -hmm. They did something I've never seen before. They worked in something called a pod system. Okay. So your safeties, you had, this is group A of safeties. This is group B. This is group C. Linebackers, they had their pods. D-line, they had their pods. And then they mixed them up. So you might have had one safeties, two corners, three defensive line, two linebackers. Huh. And the reason they did that, uh, and it was supposed to be when it started, we had so many new guys entering the program from the transfer portal. Right. And you also had Tyson Vite coming in from Iowa State, putting in a, a, an entirely new defense. Mm-hmm. So the thought was, let's do it like this, and this way we can get as much on tape as we, we possibly can with all these different combinations. The thought being, nobody would be able to hide, right? If your one yes. linebackers are out there with the two defensive line and the three safeties, you're relying on those linebackers to be the guys on the field in that right. alignment that are making plays. And they liked it so much, they didn't go away from it. And now they're talking about potentially even taking it through the summer and into the start of camp before they settle on a 2D. So we did not get to see a 2D for the entire spring. Now, from the eye test, you can kind of tell, okay, that's the one group of safeties. Right. Wherever wherever Dante Corleone is, that's the one group of defensive line. Right. That's the one group. But, but it provided an interesting contrast because you weren't getting 1s v 2s, 2s v 2s you know, 1v1s, you were you were getting a different look at it every day. Safety is the most interesting thing. Uh, they were not good, not anywhere remotely close to good enough at safety last year. Right. Everybody left. Hmm. And then you bring in a system that, you know, Iowa State system, three safeties. Yes. So we thought going into the spring, oh, man, like they're in they're in trouble at safety that might be one of the deepest spots on the team because of what they did in the portal Derek canteen from west virginia josh minkins um out of uh, uh louisville and then uh um 
I knew that was gonna start. That's why my brain was good. Calm down, <laughs> calm down. Um, uh, Kai Stokes from Ohio State. They brought in five or six guys at safety, and now you're looking at a safety position that looks like a strength, where you also have some depth uh, and and quality, and you can move guys in and out. So that one was fascinating. They're they probably I think they're better at corner. I think if you're looking at the portal, you're still probably going to need a corner mm -hmm. um, to help you out uh, with depth and everything else. But I, defensively, I think they're in a pretty good spot. I like uh, Micah Coleman, a transfer they brought in on the edge. That is really good. Um, and then Jalen Hunt, uh, who transferred in from Michigan State, uh, has been the backup to Corleone. He was very nondescript last year. He didn't really do much. Right. And ironically enough, he was on that latest episode of, of their, their YouTube series where he talked about, I was just going through the motions. Like I thought my, this was my last year. I was going to move into coaching. I didn't have a lot of motivation last year. I was just kind of out there, you know, being there. Right. And then Dante Corleone got after him in the off season. He came back for his sixth year and he had a great spring. So if he can help you and, and where you don't have to play Corleone, 60 70 snaps if you can play him 40 snaps and tell him sure. really get yeah. after it it was how he was most effective playing behind Jawan Briggs a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um so I, I I think even though we don't necessarily have a great grasp of the ones and twos we got to see a lot of guys and a lot of guys kind of put on an island um and and see if they could hold up and and most of them did so gotcha while you well, ask this question I'm gonna let her out so no, no, no problem. Driving me nuts. No problem. I well, was... first off, I love that concept um, that Chad mentioned. I like that that concept that the, the, what they were doing using the pods. Yeah, I I really like that. I I just think you know mixing it up. The one part about that is that it allows for kind of what you said, people not to hide. Yeah. Um. But I like the concept. Number one, heard of it, it gets an opportunity for even the twos to work with the ones yeah. and all of that. Everybody try to get together and say, look, you got to raise your level of play to here. If you want to get on the field, this is what you got to do. You got to get up to this level. I like that concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if a lot of people do it, but I'm not opposed to it. Now, I don't know if I would do it going into the fall because at the fall, maybe at you the wanna... beginning of camp, I think yeah. you can do that. I, did, I definitely think you can do it maybe, but obviously you got to start getting guys playing together, you know, in those groups that are, in, and you want to, you want to get them together, but yeah, I, I don't disagree. It's tough to do that on offense, sure. but on defense, absolutely. Because look, defense, let's just be honest, effort and read and react. That, that's mainly what you're doing on defense. So it's not guys having to gel together. You know, that you don't need a defensive line that's gelling together, blocking the same way or anything. It's like, no, this is my gap. I'm pressing this guy and I'm reading, reacting, or I'm going to this gap. It, it's all the same. Doesn't matter who's in there. So I, I like that concept. Um, and I also like the fact that you said everything they did in the transfer portal brings me to another question. Are they still digging? Uh, you yeah. know, it just opened. I, I think people, Chad, I think if – if you don't lean into the transfer portal, look, we can hate it. We can dislike it. But if you don't use it, you're setting yourself up for failure. I really think that you are. So are they still digging here now that it just yeah. opened? So uh, I think they're going to end up in the neighborhood of seven, eight open spots. Gotcha. Uh, for the spring. Uh, Satterfield has embraced it. Like, he, you know, he doesn't. He's like most coaches. I don't like it. I, I don't know of any coach that's like, man, I love the transfer portal. No, like, they don't. Right, because it takes away control yep. a little bit from the, the 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 lead office. But I think you have to understand that if we're going to get better, we have to to be effective in this thing, and we have to figure out a plan. And I, and I think they did the one thing in the portal that you're going to see a lot more of, uh, which is the, a, a young man's name Jack Griffith, and Jack was a scout for the Jets. Mm -hmm. And what do those NFL scouts spend most of their time doing? Going around to colleges yep. and watching and breaking down tape. And you bring a guy that's got that NFL pedigree of a, of a road scout 
and you put him on your recruiting department staff and you say, okay, scout, like scouting the transfer portal, being ready for the transfer portal is your job. And I think that helps eliminate steps yeah. of back and forth and back and forth. And, and what does he also have? He now has contacts in the NFL scouting world. Guess what they're doing? They're at all these practices around the country. Yep. So if a guy hits the portal, he can call his people and say, hey, did you get eyes on this guy? What do you think yep. about this guy? What do you think about that? And it, and it opens the door for being a lot more efficient in recruiting the transfer portal because you do a lot less guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a lot less uh, digging and trying to unearth stuff when a lot of it is right at your fingertips. So I, I think they've been really good on that front. I think obviously they'll be looking for the same thing. And this is the problem in the portal. You know what everybody wants? O-line and D-line. Absolutely. Because <laughs> they're the hardest thing yep. to judge. They're the hardest thing to evaluate at the high school level because these kids' bodies, unless so you're good, Alabama, or, their, their bodies change so drastically yep. from senior in high school to sophomore, redshirt sophomore in college. So they're going to be looking for that. I do think they'll take a look at corner. Uh, I could see them taking uh, – I think they're mostly happy with their wide receiver room, but if they could find another guy or two, sure. bring them on in and Absolutely. add them to the mix. And then uh, I, I think linebacker could be another – I think they, they're they getting to the point where they like their depth at linebacker. But Tyson Vite was a linebacker's coach at Iowa State for eight years. Even though he's coaching safeties at UC, that's a linebacker guy. Right. I'd imagine he's going to want – because when they hired him, the portal was closed. I ah. think he's going to want to go out there and get a couple tights and bite linebackers. Or whatever. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, you know, you mentioned them bringing on uh, somebody kind of like a general manager type role or head of it. I think teams that don't do that. I think you're putting yourself behind the eight ball. I yeah. look, I get it. The assistants are there. That's part of their job. But I think every school, especially at a power four school. Now you got to have some resources set aside to be able to put somebody in charge that can do exactly what you said, Chad, is just go around and find the tape, find and do your due diligence on this yep. transfer portal because there's plenty of teams out there that are doing it. Look, I don't even want to get into the, the the tampering of it all because, look, it happens. We all know that it happens. You know, we're not – nobody's going to be naive. Matter of fact, it happens now, Chad, and you can't even be punished for doing it anymore. No. So what difference does it make? So, no. uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that they brought it. I think that's a smart idea. Um, I know a lot of people don't like taking step backwards from NFL to, to college. I'm not sure that that's a step back, but I love that idea. You got all these contacts from the NFL. You come down to college. Hey, did you see this guy? I think that's ingenious to do, uh, and I'm glad Cincinnati is kind of diving into that. So yeah, well, they've, they've embraced it. They've got a GM and Zach mm -hmm. Grant who worked at Ohio state and trained in one of the best recruiting scouting departments in the country. Sure. And then Zach Griffith, Cass Simmons, uh, Carter Wilson, like they, they have a host of guys that each have different specialties. One, mm -hmm. one is the transfer portal guy. One is the relationship guy in high school recruiting. One is the scouting guy in high school recruiting. So you've got a structure of a scouting department. Right. And I, I think that's the trend. I think it's going away from recruiting departments. Even though you still have to recruit, it's going away from that and trending towards if you're not scouting, legitimately scouting, mm -hmm. you're going to get left behind in this era. Yeah, I 100 percent agree, because if you don't do that, too many other people are doing it. You're going to get behind and then you're going to wonder why well, you're not doing your due diligence. Look, things have changed even from five years ago. It's totally no. different. You got to get in and you got to figure it out. Uh, taking a look at their schedule here before we get out of here, just I'm looking at it. Townsend, Pittsburgh. I'm not sure what Pittsburgh's going to have. I, I feel like they'll be okay. Uh, they weren't great last year. Um, we thought I'm that going into last year and they stunk. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm not sure. What did how they do, though? They missed on quarterback. They missed on quarterback. They absolutely missed on quarterback. So you can't – I mean, we talked about it. Everybody knows that. You cannot yeah. not have a good quarter. I don't even think, Chad, you can have average quarterback play. Not if you're trying to be any good. You have to be you, above average. Yeah, you got to be above average. I'm not saying he's got to be the Heisman winner, but right. you got to have above average play, competent play. Yeah. Um, but I'm just kind of looking at their schedule. 
you know, it, it's it sets up. Look, the Big 12 kind of what it is. I know there's going to be a lot of people that say, well, Texas and Oklahoma left, so it's not good anymore. That's not the truth. Uh, there's going to be a lot of parity. Um, I think the schedule actually sits okay. I'm not going to say whether it's good or no, or it's bad. I know that's kind of a cop out answer, but I think it's the truth. Uh, there's some games on the road. The, t- the Texas Tech, I think UCF is going to be good. Um, they were pretty good last year, but again, they lost their quarterback. But while he was there, they were pretty good. I think Texas Tech will still be good. Uh, they don't have Arizona, and, and if I'm not mistaken, they don't have Utah. So I, I'm looking at this thing set up kind of okay for them. Here's where I think, and and this was a disaster last year. They did not win a home game uh, outside of the FCS game. Yeah, they went they went one and six at home last year. Gotcha. They have to be better at home, but absolutely at home you get Pitt. Yep. Houston. I don't think yep. they're going to be very good. Arizona State. I don't think they're going to be very nope. good. West Virginia. Let's see what Neil Brown saved his. Could have been an, an, his, an anomaly. <laughs> saved his rear end last year. He did. Let's see if that's sustainable. Let's see if that's something he can do a, a second year in a row. Correct. And then, T, and then TCU to end the season. So that's not a murderer's row at home. Those are winnable no. games. All yes. Of Yes, very winnable. Um, and then yeah, on the just... road, on the road in the Big Twelve, like you said, Texas Tech is going to be difficult. UCF is going to be difficult. Colorado, that thing's falling apart at the seams, brother. Whew. That thing is falling every apart at the seams right single, now. You hear about something every day, Chad. It, it, yeah. It's like three times a day now. So, and then at Iowa State and at Kansas State, that That'll little two game road trip in November is going to be difficult. Right. But they can start the season five and one. Right. I mean, when you look at that schedule, there's a chance four and one, five and one, getting into the, the back half of the season. That got would a be shot. success. Yeah. They got a shot. Yeah. Those two, and I was going to mention those two road games, you know, back to back in November, going to be tough. Because I think Iowa State got off to a, a slow start last year. I don't anticipate that. I think they'll be, really be better. Good. Kansas State is going to be good. Um, yeah, that'll be tough. But the rest of this, I, I just think they got a shot. Um, I do too. I, I think they got a shot. I think it's something that they they can manipulate. I would have, I would think that UC fans are anticipating going to a bowl game this year. I think that's the the baseline expectation. Right. Six and six, get back to a bowl game, show that uh, you've got some momentum coming off of a bad year one. Soresby's only a redshirt sophomore. So then you've got your quarterback in place for a couple years, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that is the direction that's the safe. If you're having reasonable, realistic expectations, mm-hmm. get back to a bowl game and, and get back at or above 500. And then you feel pretty good about the path going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Chad, thank you for for taking the time uh, today. I know it's super busy right now, uh, but which, again, that's a good thing. But I appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time. We'll have you back here again soon, even maybe even as as soon as next week. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit after the show here. We're going to take one quick break uh, from Synergy Financial and we will be back. Thank you. At Synergy Financial Partners. The vision is to build the world's largest consumer financial education and empowerment company. Synergy doesn't just offer you a financial plan. At Synergy, the goal is to help you find your best financial future. Learn more at SynergyFinancial.com. Welcome back to the show. Let's head back to the studio. All right, welcome back to Big 12 Insiders again. Cincinnati, look, they had took their their lumps last year, but they weren't intimidated. That's the thing. Coming from a smaller, you know, group of five conference, they weren't intimidated because, again, they had had a ton of success uh, and been in big time bowl games. So, and while they they got beat, they just didn't get steamrolled. So, I expect a big bounce back year. I, I'm not expecting them maybe to win the conference, but it's a possibility. I think the Big Twelve is wide open. There's going to be favorites, obviously, Utah, Kansas State, Arizona. But I think the Big 12 is wide open. There's no just team out there that you say, oh, they're just going to dominate and roll over everybody. I think Cincinnati can put their nose 
right in the mix of all of that. So appreciate everybody being here. Again, remember to like, follow, subscribe, all that good stuff. We continue to grow. It's all because of you guys. I appreciate it. Everything. We're trying to get it all moved over to at the Big 12 Insiders 24-7 on YouTube. So please go there and subscribe, like, all that good stuff. And make sure you hit the notification bell. We'll be back tomorrow to see if we can do it better. This has been a Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.